I have also seen how simple wrong decisions can also take us backwards. Because after 2017, we had the big four plan, which I've explained to you. But again, we made another simple decision to do something called the handshake. Right? And then it became BBI. And then it became a circus. And then we lost four years. And then the ruling party collapsed. And then the opposition collapsed. And then the big four collapsed. And then we ended up in null and void. <laughs> do, do you understand what I'm saying? You know? And then now we ended up with an economy that is struggling because we've lost four years that we would have leveraged on the investments we have already made, huge investments we have made in infrastructure by doing the next couple of things. Investments in housing, investments in agriculture, investments in universal health coverage so that we can leverage on whatever resources we had already put in the economy to build the infrastructure so that we can begin the journey to service our debts. But when we lost time singing reggae, nobody can stop reggae, I don't know, you know, and, 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 and with a lot of respect, I, I, I really... So, sitting where I sit, I can tell you clearly, I can see how making decisions correctly can take us forwards and making the wrong decisions can make us mark time or even go backwards. And that brings uh, uh, me to, to, this, uh, to, to this point where we are. So, good people, we have put together with these good people you see here, we put together a plan. And I tell you, it is a solid plan. And I can confirm to you from where I sit that it is a practical plan. And we intend to deliver on this plan. We have put it in four categories. Number one, we are going to be deliberate about investments in areas that will create jobs for our young people. That is going to be our priority number one. And we have every reason to prioritize investments in programs and projects that will create jobs. Because the young people of our nation are the biggest asset we have. Educated, talented, creative, hardworking. You can never have that kind of resource anywhere on earth. And how we are going to make that resource either a dividend that takes the country forward or a challenge that takes the country backwards depends on the decisions we will make and the engagements we are going to do with those young people. Is to invest in areas including the housing program that we already had identified. And for your information, we had commitments up to four trillion Kenya shillings of people who are ready to partner with us in the housing program, all we needed is an off-take plan. And the members of parliament said it here, no. That we just needed to, buy, to, to, to get the law passed that gave us the opportunity for an off-take plan. We were so busy doing all the other things, that law was not passed. Yeah? Because we were busy passing the laws to change the constitution and the rest of the things. I want to tell you, within the first 100 days, 
we will have the law to provide an off-take plan of the housing uh, agenda that will stimulate the creation of jobs and the, <laughs> and the investments that have already been committed by development partners, investors, including from this country, from the US, and many other parts of the world. That's just one. I've said including housing. Of course, the whole array of uh, informal economic development. Number two, we have said we're going to sort out our micro, small, and medium enterprises. These constitute almost 80% of all the people engaged in business in, in Kenya. They hire close to 15 million Kenyans are in that space of micro, small, and medium enterprises. From small-scale farmers, to the mamambogas, to all the hustlers in between. And the challenge they face, threefold. Number one, the environment for them to do business. We must get that environment sorted out. We cannot continue to hire people to chase others who are doing business as a studies, we should actually be organizing credit for them to do business. <laughs> we must get the correct legislation to protect everybody's business. Even hawking is a business in Europe, and it is regulated. There are laws that guide it. Right? It's, not, it's not criminal to be a hawker. All you need to do is to have the right laws so that it is done within the parameters of allowable law. Number three, we have to sort out credit. In fact, that's the elephant in business, in small-scale business. You may want to know that um, many business people in Kenya today they pay 10% per day to access credit. 10% per day. Many, if you go to any market, if you go to market in Ruai, if you go to the market in uh, Kitengela, if you go to the market in, uh, in, uh, in Kiserian, they will tell you uh, they pay 10% per day. Everybody goes to the market in the morning, they borrow 10,000 shillings. In the evening, they pay 11,000 shillings to the, to, the, to the Shylock, to the fellow who is at the market, which is 10% per day. That is 3,600% per year. While corporate companies have access to credit at 10% per year, Mamamboga is paying 3,600% per year. Do you understand what I'm saying? It looks far-fetched, doesn't look reasonable, but that is what happens on the ground. We must sort out access to credit by every business person, including the small person who has no credit record, who has no security to give to a bank, who has no track record in a bank, we must sort out access to credit. If we sort out access to credit, that is the SMEs that today make between a hundred or one dollar and two dollars a day, just by sorting out access to credit, they will move from $2 to $5 in a day. Do you understand what I'm saying? Number three, we need to sort out our agriculture, and we have plans on how to sort out our agriculture. We need to sort out 
our productivity. Let me give you an example how we need to sort out agriculture and how to sort out productivity. I will give you two examples. We are the largest producer of milk in the African continent. We produce five billion liters of milk every year. But on average, we are producing three kilos or three liters per cow. Actually, the same cow, if you feed it differently, you can produce between 15 and 20 kilos per cow. So you can increase 500 percent. Forget about 500 percent. Say even we double. If we just double the milk production and move our production to 10 billion liters and we export even 3 billion liters, we will move production of milk to the highest foreign exchange earner in our republic. It will overtake tea, it will overtake coffee, it will overtake horticulture. Mm -hmm. This is the point I was trying to make the other day when it looked like I, was, I, was, I had a problem with the people in DRC. <laughs> I was trying to say we have a huge market of milk in the African continent, starting with 90 million people in DRC, very hardworking people. We enjoy their music. They can also enjoy our milk. That's the point I was just trying to make, only that some, it went off the mark. You know? Isn't it true we enjoy uh, eh? Kanda Bongo Man and all the other people from that corner? Yeah? So, um, that's the point I was, I was trying to make. So, what we are saying is we must increase our agricultural productivity. At the moment, if you look at our statistics from Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, we spend 180 billion shillings every year to import food items, which we can produce locally, including importing some of the milk. Do you understand what I'm saying? We still import milk, we're importing maize, we are importing edible oil, we are importing rice, we are importing wheat. Yeah, 180 billion shillings. That tells you that market already exists in Kenya. So we must first invest in increasing the productivity of our farmers so that we even stop importing and feed that market ourselves. You understand what I'm saying? I know you're listening to me and you're wondering. So if things are this simple, why isn't it happening? You know, that's, the, that's the question you are asking, you know? But that, that's the dysfunction we have in Kenya. In fact, sometimes when I looked critically at uh, our Big Four plan and how we ended up not implementing the Big Four, and we ended up implementing the handshake and the BBI and the reggae. To me, it begins to look like it is actually sabotage, that there are people who do not want Kenya to move forward, that there are people who want Kenya stuck in this conundrum because I don't know it benefits who. Hmm? I mean, that's the only explanation I can, I can have because I, I don't understand how you have a plan here to create jobs. You have a plan here to invest in agriculture and increase the productivity of your farmers. You have a plan here for universal health coverage. And all of a sudden, it is not a priority. It becomes a priority to change the constitution, to create the position of prime minister and I don't know what. 
to have another position called ombudsman to undermine the judiciary and to give more power to the president to appoint ministers from parliament and all the rest of it. Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense.